to be immortal. No, the nanomachines in his body cause his wounds to close and heal at an accelerated rate. Chapter 3-3, Raging Raven. Snake, Eva, and the, Paradise, and the Paradise Lost Army are faced with multiple challenges. From Gecko blocking the way to PMC's checkpoints and even frogs swarming the areas around their path and jumping onto vans. At one point, even Raging Raven starts to come after them, along with her slider unmanned drones. This, by the way, is possibly the most hair-pullingly difficult part of the game for anyone trying to big boss emblem of Metal Gear Solid 4. For anyone else, it's actually one of the easiest parts. But anyways, I digress. After some time, Otacon believes that they've finally lost them. However, Raging Raven shoots a grenade close to them, causing the van near them to tumble over and hit the motorcycle from behind, which launches Eva and Snake off of it. They both smash into a wall, but Eva, unfortunately, is smashed against a door with a middle piece protruding from it. She stabbed pretty much in the same area that the branch penetrated her when she fell off the bike in Metal Gear Solid 3. For a second, while seeing Snake, she thought he, she was seeing Big Boss, but after coming back to her senses, she gets up. After Snake tells her that the driver of the van they crashed with didn't make it, he makes his way up the tower that Raging Raven is waiting for them in. As he makes his way up, he can hear Raging Raven screaming outside. Suddenly, Snake's body starts to seize up and he must inject himself with the syringe Naomi gave him. As he recovers, Raging Raven's scree screams get louder until finally, she blows through the wall and the battle begins after she almost throws him with her jetpack. Snake must find Raging Raven in the air while dis distinguishing her from her other drones. Meanwhile, Raging Raven can fly over him and drop grenades and other explosives at him to take him down. Despite the odds against him, Snake, as always, manages to beat Raging Raven. After beating her, Raging Raven floats in place while saying that she will never forgive Snake. Uh, Except that much like Laughing Octopus, it's clear that Raging Raven isn't talking to Snake, but whoever caused her the tra trauma. After yelling and dispersing feathers in the air, she starts to, s to say that not only does she not need anger, but she's actually not angry, she's scared. At this point her suit falls off and we see the beauty behind the beast. Once on the ground, she starts to crawl away in fear from some birds that only she, gets, she's able to, she seems to be able to see. Then she starts to approach Snake as she tells him to let her out of her cage. And the second battle begins. Much like the other beauty, she's very simple to beat. The beauties are just very good at dodging attacks, nothing more. However, Snake defeats her and she falls on the ground in an equally graceful way as Laughing Octopus. Snake picks up her grenade launcher and like before, Drebin calls him. Drebin tells Snake that he will launder the gun for him for free as long as he tell he lets him have it when he's done with it. He then tells Snake that Raven, Raging Raven must have been no older than 20. She was born in 1994 in Ake, Indonesia. Apparently this place hasn't seen peace for a long time and she was captured by one of the sides of the war. Very vague info there Drebin. She along with other kids were kept caged up for days. While in these cages, her captors would torment them and abuse them. Day after day of pain and humiliation made her a bottle of pent up anger wait, waiting to burst. After days of clinging on to hope that someone would find them, the soldiers simply left. However, this is only where their hell would truly begin as the surviving kids would start being eaten by the birds around them. After seeing the kids around her get being eaten and pecked to death by these birds, the flock finally came after her. But by some miracle, they managed to cut through her bonds instead, an opportunity that she quickly took to free herself from. And from that moment on, she would be overwhelmed with an unquenchable feeling of rage and hate. After she rips the raven to pieces, she found the soldiers that were tormenting her 
and waited for night like a predator. Once night hit, she attacked the camp and while screeching like a bird, killed every human she could find in that camp. Both soldier and other victims that the soldiers captured. At this point, it made no difference to her. After this, Snake returns to Eva and she tells him that the real van is still safe. All the vans that left with him were decoys. The real van is safe and will meet her and, and will meet with her on the riverbank. Snake and Eva decide to play it safe and head towards the river via the sewers. Before going down, Eva takes a look at her crashed bike and says that she doesn't need her bike anymore, as she's done lying to herself. Repeating her motto, I only get off my bike when I fall in love. Fall dead. She's implying that she knows she's not gonna survive this endeavor. While they go down to the sewers, we see a scarab spying on them. That's never good news. Chapter 3-4, Guns of the Patriots. Snake and Eva make it past the, past the sewers and are now in front of the river. Unfortunately, all that awaits them now is Liquid Ocelot, chilling, smoking a cigar. Eva asks Liquid where the van is, but before he gives a real answer, she notices it on fire, sinking in the river and she collapses in tears. Is that it? What do you think, Snake? At that moment, frogs surround Snake and, and Vamp along with Naomi emerge from a boat nearby. Naomi looking ashamed of herself. After offering Snake a cigar, Big Boss's favorite, seeing himself as the new Big Boss, Liquid charges at Snake and with ease takes his rifle and counters his knife to make him stab himself. Sad. Snake attempts to surprise him with a pistol, but he takes that too. Sad. Snake tells him that even if he takes control of the system, he'll only have part of the Patriot system, the military part. However, Liquid is already prepared for this. Apparently, GW, the AI they thought they destroyed in Metal Gear Solid 2, the AI that the Patriots thought they lost, is still up and running, and it's under Liquid's control. Technically speaking, Emma's worm cluster only managed to cut GW into pieces. Pieces they were able to reconstruct, and after that, they, they placed GW back in JD's network, and with Big Boss's genetic code, they are now able to bypass every security barrier in GW. Since GW is a piece of the Patriots network that they think they lost, GW is essentially a ghost in the network. In other words, Liquid has created a haven in the network. Liquid now has free reign of all military parts of the Patriot system, since the military parts is what GW controls. What he plans to do next is destroy JD itself, so that the authority of the Patriots network will pass down to from JD to GW. All of the Patriots network will, will then be under his control. He will then be able to build his, his haven and take back his identity, casting aside ocelots. After a short fight, <laughs> that snake keeps him pathetically losing, and his defense is already injured and down one arm. Liquid tells Snake that he will kill Big Boss and Zero and become a patriot himself, saying that once he kills the origin of all this mess, Zero and Big Boss, the world can be reborn. Unfortunately, his version of reborn is a wild wild west. He then kisses his brother and shocks the, the both of them for some reason. Before walking towards the boat, Eva tries to reach whatever part of Ocelot is still left in him by calling out to Adam. Adam. But Liquid ignores this and, con and continues towards the boat. Believing that as long as he, both him and Snake, the world will never see the edge of light, Liquid says that the only way the world can prosper is for them to die, and that's just not an option he's willing to take. After realizing that Meryl's team is now on their way to him, he gets on the boat and prepares for his moment of triumph. Meryl shows up with a small team on a boat and tells Liquid to stop his boat. As she says this, the team that she was put in charge of shows up all around Liquid, in boats, cars, choppers, and in the bridge, the streets, everywhere. All of this for one man. Vamp starts to look worried, but Liquid shows no signs of this even facing him. There are now f around 50 men or more surrounding Liquid in all forms of vehicles, even using lights to blind him. However, when Meryl tells him to drop their weapons, Liquid brings up his hand as if he's preparing to tell his men to fire, 
Meryl, now wanting to give him a chance, tells everyone to open fire, but right if she does, Liquid points forward and uh, nothing happens. Nobody fires. Not his soldiers and not Meryl's soldiers. Instead, all the lights blinding him go out and everybody's gun stops working. Claiming that the system is his now and that they no longer own their weapons, Liquid takes his finger in the shape of a gun, aims at the chopper and pretends to shoot them, going BANG! As he does this, the chopper he fake shoots at stop working and fall down. It's almost like he really shot them. Liquid takes a moment to laugh and then takes his finger and fake shoots at Meryl's boat, which which Nick is now in. This causes his soldier to start attacking Meryl and her team. Then, then finally, the grand finale, the true show of the Patriot's power that he now holds. He takes his finger in the shape of a gun and aims at his own head. The moment he says, BANG! Everyone starts to go haywire. He can now deactivate specific people's nanomachines at will. As usual, however, Akiba is unaffected. As his men go on a shooting spree with nobody able to shoot back, Liquid loudly yells, Do you see this, we are victorious. Finally, when everything calms down, he shoots Meryl's boat with his with his boat's cannons to move them out of the way. This knocks everyone off of the boat except for Snake and Eva. As Liquid drives by them, he tells his men to let Eva and Snake have Big Boss's body as they no longer need it. However, they throw it on a fire and Eva jumps to it to save the body. Oh, although it really, all it seems that she did was little jump into fire. There were no attempts made to grab the body, but whatever. Snake jumps in to save Eva, and as he does this, Liquid shoots the fire, causing an explosion and burning half of Snake's face. As Snake lights on, lies on the boat, tired and burnt and defeated, holding a half-burnt Eva, he calls out to Otacon in desperation, and Otacon uses the Mark II to get, to get on Liquid's boat and keep track of them. We see the carnage that Ocelot's guns of the Patriots left behind in the river. Ed and Jonathan seem to be holding on to, dear, to a threat of life, but alive they are. Meryl, on the other hand, seems to have drowned as Akiba calls out to her. We finally get to see his face when he takes off his mask to give her CPR, and after multiple attempts, Meryl regains consciousness, thanking Akiba, or Johnny, with a kiss. As Eva lies in Snake's arms, she gives him a final speech, essentially telling him that in order for the world to have peace again, he will eventually need to die himself. At least that's what I got out of it. I never understood the way that people use light and shadow in speeches in this game. After saying this, Eva dies in her son's arms. Every time Snake meets a family member, they seem to die right in front of him. Shortly after, Draven pulls up in his truck and pulls out the knife still lodged in Snake's arm. At least after all this, the monkey manages to provide Snake with a short laugh. Chapter 3-5 Returning to Your Roots once again, we see Sunny cooking eggs, except they actually come out good this time. Then we cut to the last video feed from Mark the Mark II. It shows Liquid, Naomi, and Vam talking on their boat. Liquid is planning to launch a nuke at JD, whose location they found thanks to the information in GW. Apparently, the JD AI is inside a satellite orbiting Earth disguised as a space debris. Like I said before, GW is second in command in the Patriots AI network. So once JD is destroyed, all of the authority JD had is relegated to GW, meaning Liquid will have full control of the Patriot system. However, although GW controls all military aspects and most weapons in the Patriot system, use of nuclear weapons is still an authority left to JD. This is why he's planning to use Rex, Metal Gear Rex, the same one we fought in Shadow Moses. Rex and its nuke predate the system, therefore they won't need JD's authority to use it. Also, if you remember, the scary thing about the nuclear weapon in Rex is that it was a stealth nuke, meaning JD and the other AIs won't be able to intercept it as they won't be able to see it coming. As they finish talking, Naomi steps back and accidentally hits a Mark II, which brings it to their attention. Vam grabs it, wondering what it is, and then that's when the video cuts off. 
After some talk that pretty much just sums up everything we already know, Campbell calls in and tells him the whole world is essentially in the biggest ceasefire in human history since all weapons in the system have been shut down bringing the war economy to a complete halt. However, this peace will only last until Liquid starts his insurrection. They continue to talk to figure out how Liquid is going to use nukes without JD's authority. Although, even on my first playthrough, I thought this was extremely obvious. This is why he's going to use Rex, he said it himself. I don't know how nobody caught on to this. When they ask if, um, when they ask where Rex is, Campbell proceeds to give them six freaking hints instead of just telling them. I think you know. A long forgotten base. Shadow Moses? In U.S. territory. Shadow Moses. Outside the Patriots control. So Shadow Moses. The place where Liquid made his debut. His monument. Shadow Moses. Off the Alaskan coast. Can you just say Shadow Moses? In the Fox Archipelago. It's in Shadow Moses. Shadow Moses Island. The whole island hasn't been touched since 2005, when the Shadow Moses incident happened. Snake has, uh, has another seizure while on the Nomad and uses yet another syringe. Otacon, seeing his deteriorated state, takes the syringe from him and tells him that he can't continue to go on missions like this. Liquid's got the only real functioning weapons in the world. The US military is in shambles even if their weapons worked, and even if it wasn't, Liquid has enough men and weapons to match them along with the system on his side. Otacon is essentially ready to give up at this point. After his coughing fit, Snake tells Otacon it doesn't matter how much of a chance they have of winning, they have a duty to finish this mess as they all had a hand in starting it. While saying this, he walks towards Raiden, but Sunny won't let him get close to him as he's, he's still healing. Although Raiden wants to go with him, Otacon also agrees that he's not ready as his dialysis isn't done yet. But Raiden, tired of living his life outside of his own control, forces himself to get up, telling Snake that um, after this is all over, they will both be free from this proxy war started by Big Boss and Zero. After Raiden says that he has nothing to lose, Snake, changing his mind about taking Raiden, knocks some sense into him and tells him that he still has Rose to protect. Then we get some emo talk about his birthday and weather and the lightning and whatever. Snake shows his burnt face to Raiden and tells him that he truly is the one with no future. He was created for war. He's aging rapidly, deteriorating at an increasing rate, and even with all of that, he will become a biological weapon of mass murder in a few short months. All his conversation can be summed up to Snake convincing Raiden not to follow Snake's self-destructive path. After more emoness, in which Raiden collapses and hugs Snake's legs, Sunny holds Raiden in her arms while Raiden asks Snake not to leave him alone. But Snake has made up his mind. Mei Ling then calls in. Oh, look at her. She tells him what we already know that Liquid's in Shadow Moses. Apparently, the sea line of Shadow Moses has been rising due to global warming, so although it's been untouched in 2005, it might be a little different. She tells him that she'll be on her way there herself, too. In the Missouri, though, it may take her a bit longer since, well, it's a World War II ship. After her call, they prepare for Shadow Moses, and I honestly think Snake fell asleep while Mei Ling was talking. After this, we cut to Snake already in Shadow Moses in PS1 graphics. This is how the whole level plays out for the sake of good old nostalgia. Much like the first time, Snake makes his way to a ventilation duct after noticing a surveillance camera. Liquid must have brought guards too because there are guards here. Anyways, after Snake crawls into the vent, uh, uh, Snake wakes up? Because this was all just a dream Snake was having on his way to Shadow Moses. Um, Snake and Otacon both head towards Shadow Moses in a chopper, and this is where Act 3 ends. Chapter 4-1, Shadow Moses. Act 4, Twin Sons, begins here. Being in the middle of a blizzard in a frozen hellhole, Otacon can't land the chopper very well, so Snake jumps down with Otacon's new toy, the Mark III. When he lands, he seems to have sprained his back, which reminds him of how much he is deteriorating and that he needs to hurry before his body gives out. After making it past some gecko, Snake walks down a mountain and arrives in the helipad, the same place he arrived when he went up the elevators nine years ago. Snake makes it into the tank hangar the same way as before, through the vents, but this time it's crawling with scarabs. He moves past them and makes it to the minefield where he fought the tank the last time. While in the missile hangar, he tries to open the back door which was locked the first time around, but apparently the power to the floor is out and must be turned on using a computer in the same room where he first met Otacon. The room Snake and Grey Fox had their fight. 
While there, Snake starts to seize up again and takes yet another syringe. He knocks over the Mark III, I'm guessing so Otacon doesn't see him using the syringe and berate him for it. Anyways, after inputting the password, the system finally comes back online. Before heading out, they take some time to recall memories, remembering how Naomi hated her for killing Frank, which is what led to the Patriots turning him into a cyborg ninja with a drug-dependent, delirious mind. However, and upset, as, uh, as upset as Otacon is about her going back to Liquid, Snake starts to wonder, what did she really even do to them? While she did give Liquid Snake's blood, if that was all, she didn't have to join them afterwards. What did she really do while she was there? Neither of them can really think of a good reason why she would do that. After finding out that Naomi and Vamp have both been through here, Snake moves out. Once they make it back to the door, the Mark III starts to unlock it and both him and Otacon make it past the gate. Chapter 4-2 Crying Wolf The gate takes him all the way back to where Snake fought Sniper Wolf for the first time around, so right between the two communications towers. There he is hunted by Crying Wolf, just in time for him to have another seizure, however, however he actually manages to get past this one without a syringe. After getting shot a few times by a freaking mini railgun, like the one Fortune was carrying in Metal Gear Solid 2, the fight with Wolf begins. This beast is actually quite an intimidating one. Not only can she smell you in this blizzard, but the blizzard itself makes her hard to spot, and when you do spot her, normally she spots you first, and she is big. Unlike the other beasts, she's not just a woman in a bodysuit, she's actually in a wolf mech, and it will charge at Snake. However, as always, despite the odds being stacked against Snake, he manages to beat her at her own game. Whether by blowing up the grenades hanging on the side of the mech's legs, or just by being the better hunter. Anyways, we know the pattern at this point. She leaves the suit, pieces fall off, she talks to Snake, but not really to Snake, but to something only she can see or hear, and then the battle finally begins. Her battle is like all the others, easy. She dodges bullets, but eventually dies. When she dies, Snake gets her railgun and Draven calls in for her life story. Crying Wolf was from Africa, one of the many areas in Africa tearing itself apart over ethnic cleansing. When she was just a little girl, her family was killed by rival armed factions. She, along with her baby brother, ran as far away as she could, but at one point, she came across more soldiers. She hid in an abandoned shack, carrying her baby brother, and waited until they left. But while she waited, her brother began to cry. Knowing that they would both die if the soldiers heard the cries and found them, she wrapped her arms tightly around his mouth until she could no longer hear the soldiers walk around her. At this moment, she came back to her senses and realized that not only was her brother not crying anymore, but he wasn't breathing. She continued wandering the wilderness with her dead brother in her arms until she came across a refugee camp. The whole time she wandered, she had visions of a wolf walking alongside her, constantly howling and crying like her brother did. By the time she made it to the camp, her brother's body had already rotted away. Every night in the refugee camp, she was haunted by the wolf's cries and, and the cries of all the other children in the camp. The cries that would only remind her of her brother, whom she suffocated to death. One night while the babies cried, her desperation caused the wolf and her visions to come to her aid and silence the children one by one. Of course there was never a wolf, she killed those babies herself, but she never let herself accept this. Draven believes that fighting Snake made Wolf finally accept what she did, cleansing her mind. All that's left now is Screaming Mantis, the leader of the pack who has been controlling the others.